Come, let us gather to worship our timeless God. We gather together to share with your children the past blessings we have received from our God. Come, let us gather to worship our awesome God. We gather together to listen for God's word for us today. Come, let us gather to worship our glorious God, who delights in our worship, witness, and service. We gather together to share our hope and trust in our merciful God, who has never failed or forgotten us. to worship and we come to this time of prayer as we hear the comfort of Psalm 62 and as we sing and as we pray together knowing that our God hears all of our joys and sorrows let us go to God in prayer save me, and I calmly wait for God. God alone is the mighty rock that keeps me safe in the fortress where I am secure. I feel like a shaky fence or a sagging wall. 
How long will all of you attack and assault me? You want to bring me down from my place of honor. You love to tell lies. And when your words are kind, hatred hides in your heart. My soul is at rest in God God gives inward peace, and I depend on Him. God alone is the mighty rock that keeps me safe, and He is the fortress where I feel secure. God saves me and honors me. He is that mighty rock where I find safety. My soul is at rest in God. all things and makes all things new we come to you tired bodies weary minds flooded hearts overwhelmed we wonder where you are in these turbulent times that overload our bodies minds and souls my soul is at rest in God O oh God, who illuminates the darkness, help us smash the heavy idols we hold, so that we may live freely and lightly in Jesus Christ our Lord. Help us be gentle with ourselves and with others as we walk through the day, and as we go, help us discern what to enter into and what we need to step away from. My soul is at rest in God alone. My salvation comes from God. O oh God, whose largeness cares for every sparrow and every single hair on our heads, help us cling to you in the unknowing and lead us to rest in you when our inner and outer lives are overwhelmed and when we have rested may we enter into the work of creating a more just more peaceful more equitable world my soul is at rest in God many times do we look for salvation in all the wrong places in the plans we made surely that will protect us in our financial wealth in the houses we build surely that will protect us but God we know that they are as fleeting as breath and our salvation only comes from you and we know this when we stop to rest when we pull away from this world that tells us to do more, to be more, that your worth is only based on how much productivity you have, God, you call us away with a different voice to say your work will not save you. Your money will not save you. Your plans will not save you. Rest in me. And God, that is hard. To let go of control, it's hard, God, to trust you when it seems like everything around us is falling apart. And so, God, may this time of worship once again be a place where we slowly let go of our control and place it back into your hands so that you can give us rest, so that you can renew our souls, so that we can 
Go back out into the world and begin to work on thy kingdom come. From this place of wholeness that you promise us, promise us, God, from there we can go and bring your grace and your love to everyone who we know needs it. And God, there are so many in our lives, in our communities, the people we love who need you right now. And so God, we surrender to you and to your salvation as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My soul is at rest in God alone. My salvation comes from God. Our scripture this morning comes from the very first book of our Bible, from Genesis. I'll be reading selections from both chapters 8 and 9. God did not forget about Noah and all the animals with him in the boat. So God made a wind blow and the water started going down. God stopped up the places where the water had been gushing out from under the earth. God closed up the sky and the rain stopped. For 150 days, the water slowly went down. Then on the 17th day of the seventh month of the year, the boat came to rest somewhere in the mountains. The water kept going down, and the mountaintops could be seen on the first day of the 10th month. God said to Noah and his sons, I'm going to make a solemn promise to you and everyone who will live after you. This includes the birds and the animals that came out of the boat. I promise every living creature that the earth and those living on it will never again be destroyed by a flood. The rainbow I have put in the sky will be my sign to you and to every living creature on earth. It will remind you that I will keep this promise forever. The rainbow will be the sign of the solemn promise. Noah built an altar where he could offer sacrifices to the Lord. Then he offered on the altar one of each kind of animal and bird that can be used for sacrifice. The smell of the burnt offering pleased God, and God said, Never again will I punish the earth for the sinful things its people do. All of them have evil thoughts from the time they are young, but I will never destroy everything that breathes as I did this time. As long as the earth remains, there will be planting and harvest cold and heat, winter and summer, day and night. Noah and his three sons came out of the boat. Ham later had a son named Canaan, and all people on earth are descendant from Noah's three sons. Noah farmed the land and was the first to plant a vineyard. One day he got drunk and was lying naked in his tent. Ham entered the tent and saw his father naked, then went back outside and told his brothers. Shem and Jepheth put a robe over their shoulders and walked backwards into the tent. Without looking at their father, they placed it over his body. When Noah woke up and learned what his youngest son had done, he said, I now put a curse on Canaan. I asked the Lord my God to bless Shem. I pray that the Lord will give Jepheth more and more land. Noah lived 350 years after the flood and died at the age of 950. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen.
What does it mean to rejoice when we are weary, trying to find hope in these areas of our life when the world seems to be pulling us down? For 10 months now, we have been weary of this pandemic and how it has altered our lives. But for longer than that, we have been carrying the weight of financial stress, racial injustice, divided relationships, and an overabundance of brokenness. What better time to talk about being weary than the long, cold, gray days of January? I think what makes our grief particularly powerful in this season is our inability to express and relieve it. All the birthdays we have missed, the graduations still waiting, how can we rejoice when we still cannot resolve the pain that is within us? Sorrow and sadness, these are not new emotions to us, but in this time of social distancing and quarantine, it's taken away our traditional methods and our ability to cope. We hold this grief while we cannot hug a friend. We cannot sit in our sanctuary. We can't visit our favorite spot. We can't even hold a memorial service. And so we come to the scriptures, to our stories, to our quiet times of faith. And we look for solace and for encouragement. And even if the words coronavirus, Black Lives Matter, domestic terrorism, they don't explicitly happen in our Bible, I think God still has a word for us today in the story of Noah and the flood. It's a familiar story to many, and I think it's a place where many of our emotions, many of our thoughts right now can find this point of connection. The very first words of our holy text begin with this resounding proclamation that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. God separated the waters from the land, brought forth life in the Garden of Eden, and created Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve lived in the Garden, this time marked by innocence, beauty, and faith. Until Adam and Eve disobey God and they eat from the tree of knowledge, the forbidden fruit, they realize they are naked and they hide from God. And so for their disobedience, God expels them from the Garden of Eden and out into the world they go, having to work the soil, experience pain and sorrow. Adam and Eve have children, and only a few generations later, we come to Noah. Genesis chapter 6, it says, More and more people are born, they spread across the earth, but the Lord saw how bad the people on earth were, and that everything they thought and planned was evil. God was very sorry that God made them, and God said, I'm going to destroy every living creature on earth. I'm going to wipe out all people, animal, bird, reptile. I'm sorry I ever made them. But the Lord was pleased with Noah, and this is the story about him. So God decides to send a flood and wipe out the earth. Noah, who lives right and obeys God, is warned and told to build an ark. So Noah, his family, and the animals climb aboard the ark. They seal the door just as the heavens open and water falls. In chapter 7, it says, The sky opened like windows. Rain poured down for 40 days and nights, destroying everything on earth. And thus begins Noah's life in quarantine, locked away as time becomes meaningless, confined to this social bubble, probably having to homeschool his children on the ark, no sun or stars to mark the beginning of day or night, and living with this incredible trauma and guilt. Many rabbis believe that Noah was probably the last person to hear about the Garden of Eden from a second-hand account. He's just close enough in the genealogy of Adam that the story of this perfect garden, where one could walk with God at night, it's not folklore or some distant knowledge. 
And I think about how difficult Noah's time in quarantine must have been, spending days in darkness and isolation, trying to process all of the death and all of the destruction. His neighbors, his farmland, everything around him annihilated. And so he's trying to reconcile the story of creation, the story of Adam and Eve and his family, as he witnesses the terrible act of uncreation and the destruction of all of that. The rain finally stops. It's almost a year before the waters go down enough for Noah and his family to leave the ark. Now the work of creation must begin again. And God makes a promise that these markers of time, summer, winter, harvest, planting, they'll never be taken away again. And to mark the promise, God puts a rainbow in the sky. Do not be fooled, this is not the happily ever after we think it might be, because this is where our scripture for today comes in, the epilogue to the flood story. Here we have Noah who leaves the ark and thus becomes the bridge between the stories. Holding together, holding together the events before the flood, of the Garden of Eden. And now the leader of this new society where the second creation must happen. So Noah leaves the ark, takes the time to plant the vineyard, to harvest the grapes, to make the wine, to get drunk and end up naked in his tent. You know, rabbis and commentaries do not chastise or fault Noah for this act. Most of them see a desperate man trying with his very limited human strength to go back to the Garden of Eden. What if Noah remembered the stories of the freedom and the innocence of Eden? And after all he had survived, all that he had witnessed, he's just trying to recreate this world that is gone. And so he takes fruit perhaps maybe even the same mystery fruit from the tree of knowledge, and drowns his sorrows to the point that he becomes naked, just like Adam and Eve. Desperately trying to find peace and order after his year of darkness and chaos. Here's the painful truth that Noah struggled to accept. The Garden of Eden was gone. And it was never replaced after the flood. All that remained was the story. Noah could not. We cannot recreate a world that once was. We have the stories, but we cannot go back. And yet we still have to deal with the grief and the loss that comes from this destruction and recreation. The story of Noah that connects so deeply to our experience right now is because it's a story of both mourning and hope. To name that world that never will be, but to hope for a world that will come. Because until Noah can name his trauma, his loss, that he is trapped and he cannot participate in what could be. And that sits heavily with me as we are trying to hold multiple traumas and pain in our hearts right now, that 400,000 people who have died from COVID will never be at our dinner tables again. They won't be at the birthday parties. They won't be at the celebration when this is all done. That a terror, domestic terror attack can happen on our nation's capital. And even after these past few weeks, we can't move forward with a new world of racial equality until we name the realities of racism and white supremacy that hold power. Unless we name the harm that the realities of all of this has brought upon our nation, name the harm that our queer siblings, our brown-skinned siblings, the immigrant and minority siblings have suffered, the naivety of that world is gone. Trying to make anything great again is gone. We cannot go back. But we can remember. 
And by naming the pain, by acknowledging our loss, we can let the past shape our future. We can create new holy spaces that we build ourselves. We can't go back to the Garden of Eden, but we can create the world we want to see. We can be partners with God in the work of creation. We can fulfill our prayer for God's kingdom to come and God's will to be done through justice and mercy, through love and compassion in our families, in our communities, in every relationship that we hold, that after this time of destruction, we can begin planting the seeds of truth and respect, examining ourselves, our own racism, sin, and pride, and see how God's going to take these small acts and turn them into a harvest of goodness and joy. Like many of you, I was inspired by the poet Amanda Gorman from the inauguration this past week. To think that her words could make my weary soul rejoice again. She wrote, let the globe, if nothing else, say this is true, that even as we grieved, we grew. Even as we hurt, we hoped. Even as we tired, we tried. If we're to live up to our own time, the victory won't lie in the blade, but in all the bridges we've made. That is the promise to Glade, the hill we climb if only we dare. It's because being American is more than the pride we inherit. It's the past we step into and how we repair it. We will not march back to what was, but move to what shall be. The power of those words. The gospel hope that is poured out for us in that, like a sweet offering expressing the truth of our pain and preparing us for what comes next. How do we rejoice when we are weary? It's not in what we inherit. It's not in going back, ignoring all that we're holding deep inside. It's in confession and prayer. Putting our prayers, our presence, our time, our talent, our service towards what matters. It's in what we get to build. And that gives me hope. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.
can do the good work of building this week. We can do the good work of bringing forth the work of creation of justice, mercy, and love because our foundation is sure. Because Jesus holds us, guides us, and cheers us on. So do not be afraid to be part of the good work that is to come, no matter how you feel, for there is a solid foundation under your feet, and you can take that next step because Jesus is with you. Go this week and know that you are loved. Amen. <laughs>